questions. Um, so, right, I, what I was going to say is that I've got some, I'm hopefully going to have some time for some questions at the end, so uh, if you think of anything while I'm speaking, uh, remember it and ask me later uh, and we can chat. And also, so this uh, talk, I'd describe it as fresh, right? Like, so it's like, it kind of mostly written over the last weekend or so, and so I think there's going to be a lot of points that I'm probably not going to hit that well, um, and so... Yeah, I'd really love any kind of feedback or ideas or kind of, because, uh, yeah, I'm going to try and cover a lot. So, yeah, I'm Ben. Um, so, I, a few years ago, I helped found JS Oxford, uh, along with a few other guys, and then helped run it for a few years uh, before you guys took over. And I think it's given me a really interesting perspective being back here and speaking. And from that perspective, I think the thing that I kind of see very clearly is that Sarah and Marcus, you're doing a really great job. Like, uh, <laughs> like uh, yeah, it's like uh, when uh, two months ago you emailed me to be like, uh, oh, like this is the date of the meetup, uh, I, just so you're ready. I was just like, I almost cried. <laughs> you were just like, so beautiful, um, how prepared you are for this. Um, last time I spoke in front of JS Oxford, I was speaking at the 2016 wrap up, like kind of summing up the year, which was shit. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I was kind of talking about that kind of stuff. So I thought I'd just quickly go over what I've been doing since 2016. Uh, 2017 happened. Uh, I did some kind of freelancey stuff. Uh, I did some stuff with like bones and galleries. Uh, towards the, the the end of the summer, I kind of wasn't enjoying that too much, so I went into fund management, uh, which is kind of fun, and I worked there for like uh, six months in this kind of like uh, fund management company doing contracting there, and after that I switched to work at Oxpotica, uh, there's a few Oxpoticarians here, um, who we do kind of autonomous vehicles, and uh, so kind of like driving cars around, you know what autonomous vehicles are, <laughs> um, and yes, yeah, so I worked there for a few months. Around October, I went up to Sheffield and had a, a burger with Ryan. Uh, this is a picture of me having a burger with Ryan. He's doing really well. Uh, he's still drinking beer out of the side of his mouth. Um, and yeah, then after that burger, me and my girlfriend went to New Zealand um, uh, and we did cycling for a few months. And during that time, um, I put together some hacks, so kind of relevant to the talk before. We built this GPS tracker. So this is running Esprino, and you saw this ID working before in Gorn's talk, and this was logging our positions as we went through New Zealand, uh, so kind of checking that all the time. Also, as well as uh, logging our positions, we wanted to have something that would track our kind of like subjective opinions of places, so we built the stuffometer, um, <laughs> which is a series of dials which let you see, say how happy you're feeling about the wildlife or the scenery and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we 3D printed it in a library, which is another option. Um, so there's a library in Auckland, has a 3D printer, and it costs, I think, $1 to print out that, which is super cool. Um, that's it on my bike. <laughs> um, and so when I saw some wildlife that was cool, I could just, like, turn the green knob, um, which is cool. Uh, yeah, so we did that. That was 2018. Uh, still cycling in 2019. Uh, it started off quite painfully because I got hit by a, a, trans, uh, by a, a van uh, off my bike and broke my collarbone. Um, that sucked, but then I went to Australia, which was kind of fun. Vietnam, which was a lot of fun. And then I came back and started back at Oxbotica, which is brilliant. So um, I'm back at Oxbotica now, um, doing a different project. I'm gonna show you a quick uh, video of that project I'm working on, because it's cool. Uh, so this is a web browser, and this is entirely using uh, web technology, so um, yeah, it's using WebGL and kind of what's really cool about this is although it looks looks nice and fancy, uh, behind the scenes in the code, it's got very kind of idiomatic web development um, principles and architectures, and uh, it's a, it's it's really fun to work on. Um, to find out more, so this talk is not related to that at all, but if you want to find out more about this, uh, you can go to oxbotica.com. Uh, go across, uh, click on the careers button, uh, scroll down past the face box, <laughs> uh, this is as I like to call myself, uh, apply for a job and come work with us and I'll tell you all about it. Um, <laughs> so that's cool. Uh, so today I was going to talk about protocol buffers and gRPC. Um, I don't <coughs> who's heard of that. Cool. Like, oh, no, half, that's cool. So 
the first thing I want to say is like, so these technologies, they're not kind of like new or trendy, right? Like, so basically protocol buffers came out 10 years ago and there's a bit of a spike. Uh, and then there's kind of gradually um, kind of there's been interest there. GRPC has kind of been great, gaining interest over the last few years. It was announced like, like four or five years ago. And basically what they are for is protocol buffers are a way of serializing objects and sharing them in between processes. Uh, gRPC is a way of kind of building APIs. And so generally they're quite, they've been quite well thought of and well used, so they're quite popular. Um, but something that's really interesting is that they're not so popular in the web, industry, the web front end industry. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, this is really interesting. The reason I think this is, is because when we come to serializing objects, we tend to go for JSON. And we've got really good reason for that because our JSON serializers and are really optimal and doing it in a browser is like super fast and it's, it's kind of a first class thing. Um, and when we're building an API, the, the web has, the very first request to a web server was a REST kind of request. It just wasn't formalized that way. So basically the way we view tech is from a very biased viewpoint where we kind of pick these ways of constructed APIs based on how we've kind of used them in the past. Um, and because of that, I think we end up with an architecture that's kind of like this. So we've got a back end, which is talking like uh, gRPC protocol buffers and all that kind of stuff. And we've got our front end, and we've basically got this box in between, which serves a, an API which serves JSON to us. And we're kind of, yeah, that's, that's what we end up with. So what I want to kind of talk about in this talk is how we can really go towards this, where in our front end, we've got this notion of protocol buffers and we're using that and we can use gRPC to kind of talk into that. So this is kind of the idea of this talk is like, how might this feel? So uh, first of all, I'm just going to go into protocol buffers and give a kind of brief introduction to this. Uh, the, as I said before, JSON and protocol buffers do similar things. So the way I'm going to describe, explain how protocol buffers work is start with JSON and see the changes that you would go through to, be, to come into protocol buffers. So this is what JSON looks like. You've got something here that is sho shoving this JSON object over to something there, like these two entities. Uh, it's a big string of a particular structure. So the first thing we can notice is that there's a lot of this isn't really being stored very efficiently. It's all just a string, uh, even these numbers and stuff. So what we could do is we could, we could store this more efficiently in a binary form. So for instance, number in JSON, we'd ship that as a string, which would turn into all these bytes over here. Whereas if we're using gRPC, we'd use a, a var int encoding for this, um, which kind of as the number gets larger, it, um, it kind of adapts to that. Um, if you, I'll put these slides up online. Uh, there's a bit of a, a demo here which shows how those numbers are encoded and how that works, that's kind of fun. Um, another example of this is like when you're uh, sending a Boolean, instead of sending a, a byte, we're sending uh, four characters for true. Um, so it's like, it seems kind of slightly not so efficient. Um, and again, in JSON, we end up using this thing, which is like quite often we'll be using base64 or hexadecimal encoding in our strings when actually we could uh, be shipping just raw bytes for that. So for instance, uh, this is I think 280 bytes, whereas it, it, if you did it in a raw way, it would be 128. So it's like more than double the kind of size. So going back to JSON, what we could do is we could take out all our things and we could just replace it with these magically well structured objects. Um, and that's good. But then, uh, so, and so we've just kind of solved that problem. Another problem that you get with JSON is like, it's quite loose as a kind of encoding. So here, if we put an update to this, this back end, and instead of sending a, a message, it's sending a massage, because uh, someone spelled that wrong. Um, that, you, that's a problem, because like, in the other side, you're, not expe you're expecting the, the object to have a specific kind of form. So the way that we might do that is, the way we might solve this is to have a, a central type, so a kind of file, so message.type, and that defines what the keys are, and then we can use that to generate code in the front end and the back end, and then we can use that code to generate the message, and that means that because we've generated that code, there's no way of misspelling that key. So it's kind of, um, it's, it's much safer. And then once we've got these stubs on either side, something we can notice is 
we don't actually need to send the keys at all. So we can just send numbers instead of the keys. So we can send this kind of an object that's a lot simpler without any of the kind of meta information and with more efficient kind of storage uh, in there as well. So uh, we've invented protocol buffers. Uh, go us. <laughs> so yeah, this is essentially what protocol buffers are. You write a message.proto. Um, you use this protoc tool to generate some JavaScript, and then in your JavaScript, you can import that JavaScript, and this message object can serialize to these protocol buffer um, blobs. And this is what that, uh, that language looks like. So for instance, we've got an example message, and that's got a string, um, which is a name, a boolean, which is burger, and a float for how much. So this is like these three properties. And where these get really useful, so this is a very basic one, where these get very useful is where they're much more complex. And you can imagine those benefits of not ever making a mistake in misspelling a key or mis mistaking the structure. So we're going to have a demo just now. Um, I was going to demo in Chrome Canary, but I got an update an hour ago, and now this happens whenever I open it. <laughs> so uh, we're not going to use Chrome Canary. Uh, we're going to use Chrome Chrome. <laughs> So, sorry for being uh, out of date. <laughs> uh, right, so, where are we? Um, right, okay, so. Right, so here we have a web page. So what we can do is we can store a name, uh, Ryan, and you can see that down the bottom, so we're base64 encoding this, but we would actually kind of be sending that probably out as, a, as the raw bytes. Um, is this person a burger? How much of a burger are they? Probably about <laughs> 85. Uh, and then we can take this. Oh, don't know what happened there. Uh, paste that in here. And so we're able to kind of like generate that message here, deserialize it down here, and pull out the information. And what's cool about this is like, so this is obviously in the same window, but it could be across a network, it could be from a file or whatever like that. Could be anything. Uh, okay, so back to here. So the good stuff about this uh, is that, so we would generate JavaScript and just use it in one place, but you can generate these stubs for any language you want. So basically, although that came from a server, it could have, instead, it could have been generated by, uh, from in Go, or in kind of uh, Python, or C++, or anything, and you basically got that same kind of safety in those same stubs. So, um, the kind of portability that you get is like really, really powerful. Uh, another thing is like, I think in why this is good for the web is I think we tend to do quite a lot of like type translations. So if you imagine you've got a database and you're pulling to-dos from it and you imagine the steps to kind of render this to uh, a, a web page, you might say, first of all, on your backend server, you have like a, a, a model, a, a class that represents that model then you generate some JSON and pass that to your REST layer, which might kind of alter some keys based on the requests or something like that, or how it combines it together. Or, And then finally, you get it into your browser with fetch. And at this point, you have no idea what it is, right? Like you're kind of hoping it's JSON, but um, it's like that's, yeah, you're kind of, you have to kind of check if it's even uh, like anything. Um, so you've got this, and then in the front end now, we would create a, a front end class Call to do item, uh, pull the JSON into that and populate that. And then finally, once we've done that, we would then have our kind of front end component, which has takes that data. And like, although these are all like really cool, well documented things, there's like five of them, right? Like, which is a lot. And so we were kind of having to, to kind of switch data types quite a lot. Whereas if we're using protocol buffers, we could here have an object and have another object here and just pass the data straight between them and we wouldn't have even had to write those objects in the first place, they'd be generated for us. So it basically avoids a lot of this kind of translation and when it comes to like updating stuff, that, that can help quite a lot. Cool, so that's protocol buffers. Um, we're gonna talk about gRPC. And so I said before, it's like gRPC is like kind of similar space to rest in that it's a way of like one thing talking to another thing. Um, so yeah, 
that, that's how that works. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare the two of, like, I'm going to compare REST and gRPC, and kind of we're going to look at some of the differences. Um, so I think the first thing to note is the, they've got different goals. So uh, REST is more about kind of modeling state, right? So it's representational state transfer or something. Um, and so it's more about, we've got this, these kind of files and objects over here, how do we kind of get them over there? And that's the kind of goal and the aim that it solves. Whereas gRPC, uh, so RPC is remote procedure call, and that's, that's about kind of taking functions from your code and, and executing them elsewhere. So that's the kind of the space that it comes from. And as a result, they've kind of got these different models. So architectural, uh, architecturally, REST is what you call resource oriented. So it's about resources. And that is opposed to gRPC, which is service oriented. And you can kind of see this, uh, the, the nicest way of explaining this is through, if you look at the identifiers that each one uses. So in REST, you have this thing where we're looking at posts 42, comments 15, and so there's this kind of hierarchy of that, that resource, that data. Um, and whereas, so that's the way you identify something in REST, whereas in gRPC, you identify a service followed by a kind of function within that. So it's kind of, you're, you're identifying a function rather than content. Um, so it's, it's a service orientated architecture. Um, the interactions between your client and server is slightly different in gRPC from REST. So in REST, you have a notion of, you make a request, you get a response, request response, and that is shared by gRPC, so you make that same kind of unary thing. Uh, though gRPC also re supports request responses. So you make a single request to the backend server, it streams responses back to you. Um, and it doesn't stop there. You've also got requests response. So that is, you are streaming requests to the web server, and then it is sending one response back. Um, and also you've got requests responses, uh, which is bi-directional streaming. So you basically, everyone can be sending stuff everywhere, um, which is, which is kind of cool. Does GRPC still run over HTTP? Uh, yeah, I will get to that. <laughs> um, in the transport slide. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, so REST is uh, <laughs> almost. Yeah, yeah. Um, REST runs like so. Every web server has uh, like from day one supported HTTP and REST. Um, whereas gRPC uses HTTP two only, and the reasons for this are partly because of that streaming thing, um, but also uh, there's some kind of nuances to the way, if you're, if you're kind of calling a lot of functions, you don't want them to block each other, so, actually, that's great. Right, okay, so, uh, REST 1.1 introduced pipelining, so basically you can make several requests and receive several responses, um, but those pipe, that pipelining isn't multiplexed, so you can, in HTTP2, um, you can send several requests and they can come back at different times, so they, the responses won't be in the same order as you submitted them which makes it really uh, useful to have the HTTP2 part for um, an RPC service. So that's, yeah, that's, that's the reason why. Um, so, and related to this, uh, so the browser support uh, for REST, 100%, like every, every web browser ever has supported REST. Every web browser in the future will support REST. gRPC is slightly different, it's like 0%, <laughs> um, which is like, yeah. A, a bit of a problem. Uh, so yeah, because of the HTTP two, and even if even though browsers do support HTTP two, um, the control you need to know the, the control you need to have over the kind of framing, um, you're probably not going to get that in the browser anytime soon, I guess. Um, so there are alternatives. So uh, gRPC Web is a kind of alternative protocol which is very similar to gRPC but supports HTTP one point one um, and I think Web Sockets as well. So uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting that, that protocol document t tells you the differences between the protocols and why you can't do uh, gRPC from a browser. Um, if you want to use gRPC today, you've got three options. The first one is to use this web proxy. Uh, so this is a, uh, a pretty straightforward, you've got a, a backend service, you put a thing in the middle, it translates the stuff going between it, uh, and that works really well. If you're in more of a kind of uh, microservice Kool-Aid kind of thing, uh, you can use the Envoy proxy approach, which is like um, basically 
every service is, is in this kind of like service mesh and they can all talk to each other through this this app mesh thing and you can be part of that mesh. I don't know, there's a lot of the word mesh in it, um, but it's, it's good. Uh, yeah, and so the, that proxy, uh, the Envoy proxy service thing does uh, automatic translation when you connect to it, um, which is cool. Uh, and the other option is like to, to not do it today, but to wait, wait for the future, uh, because like, so, the idea with gRPC web, so it's still quite kind of relatively new, but once it's more kind of well used and well um, understood, then they might start rolling it out into um, into the actual kind of like frameworks and stuff. So you'll be able to, in the same way as you'll start a regular gRPC service, you might start a gRPC web service on a different port or something like that, which would be cool. So the cool thing about gRPC, so we've kind of talked about the transport and all that kind of stuff. The, the really cool thing is that um, the interfaces are typed in the same way as protocol buffers type objects. So what you do is you define a service. So here we've defined the calculator service. And this number list is a protocol buffer. Uh, that number that's returned is a protocol buffer. And what this means is that when you, you, what you can do is you can actually generate the clients, uh, the service client and the service server, um, and do that automatically. So in the same way as we've got all that type safety across multiple languages, you get this uh, for uh, oh, yeah, a web service, essentially, which is super cool. So I've got a demo of this. Um, the, the service that I've implemented is uh, the Zoom service. The kind of key thing about it, it gives privileged access to your computer, and the way you should install it was uh, without your knowledge. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, what we're going to do is we've got like an echo service, um, this system info one, which is a streaming service, so you send a single request and it streams back, a screenshot one, which returns a richer object, and then a set color scheme one, which doesn't do much. Um, so let's look at this. So here... We're going to close this. So we're going to run demo one. De oh, no, not that. I used NPM scripts for this, which is cool. So for this, we're going to have to run a backend as well. So a demo two dot backend. So I'll make that bigger. So on this side, we're running this uh, node service, which is exposing a gRPC service. And it's also, that is in turn running that proxy in front of it uh, as part of that. And here we've got web server, um, good old web servers. So here what we can see is, uh, first of all, we've got this echo service. And we can, any input here gets translated live uh, by that backend service. So I can say, hello world. Um, and it's, it's not just echoing it, it's uppercasing it and adding emoji, uh, which is like, yeah, a good feature. <laughs> um, the system info, so this is the streaming response that I said. So this is gathering uh, the live CPU usage on that, on the host, on the service that is implemented um, and giving the battery. So you can see battery 84 matches my battery 84 up there, um, which is cool. Uh, down here, so I can do a screenshot, and that's kind of the system is taking a screenshot and then loading over gRPC into the browser, um, and so we can kind of carry on gathering more of these and get a kind of like weird, cool effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we're kind of. Yeah, um, we're using gRPC to kind of create art, I guess. Um, so yeah, that, that works. And then the, the last one, so that was what I was showing there, is that's kind of a, a richer, a bigger bit of data, um, and that still works over this kind of this process. Uh, so we've got these two buttons here. Uh, I can press the light one, and it'll take the whole thing into light mode. Uh, so I can kind of toggle the system light and dark mode um, through a web browser. Um, because it's like implementing that node process. All right, so we've got that. Cool, cool. So uh, why is this so cool? 
Um, the first thing is, like I've, I mentioned a bit before, uh, updating a service. So if you were to make any kind of tweaks to that service, you can basically just recompile it, send it out to uh, like generate the stubs, and then you know from your code that your ser you no longer implement that service correctly, um, hopefully, especially if you're using something like TypeScript or something. Um, another thing that's cool is like, so uh, microservices, in the last few years, backends have kind of been switching over to microservice architectures, and front ends have been switching over to component architectures, so like React, Vue, and all that kind of stuff. I think there's something really interesting to gain out of this. So if you've got a particular component that is linked to a particular backend service, then those two can basically kind of update together um, without having to interrupt anyone else. And I think there's a real kind of powerful symmetry there, um, but I'm not, I'm not quite sure what it is. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last thing is, I, like, I think I've got this feeling that this kind of avoids siloing, right? Like, so I think in the web, when we're on the web platform, quite often we're just like, this is our domain, right? Like, it's like, give us JSON and like, and whereas this, you have to kind of start talking about how objects are structured throughout the entire stack, right? Like, so, and I think there's something kind of great there about, um, about working together and in less of a kind of like web bubble thing. Um, but yeah, again, I'm not sure about that either. So uh, yeah, quick summary of what I've talked about so far. Um, we said protocol buffers, this is like object serialization. Uh, gRPC, which is this kind of uh, procedural call API thing. Um, and back to the original thing. So what we were talking about is like, can we take these services from the back end who are talking to each other and make use of that? And I think the answer is we can, and this is a bit of a faff, but there's, there's kind of quite some benefits. Um, so I want to talk about really quickly, how am I doing for time, by the way? You are. That's cool. Um, <laughs> how about what something that we could do is like, now that we've kind of taken this cool uh, back end technology, how about we just like skip the back end entirely um, and use it for ourselves? Um, so what about instead of having any back end services involved entirely uh, in, at all, we can have two browsers talking to each other directly using um, gRPC? And how would this feel? What kind of things would we do? Um, so I, I kind of think of this as like peer RPC, uh, so like kind of peer-to-peer -peer RPC in browsers. Um, and the way this can work is like, so you've got two browsers. The first, first one says, hey, I'm a server. Uh, and the second one says, hey, connect me to that server. And then this backend service, which is somewhere, um, gives a kind of proxy for these two to connect together directly using WebRTC data channel. And then the interesting thing about this is like, so this is like, it feels like a web socket, uh, but it goes directly from that browser to the other browser. So if you're on a local Wi-Fi network, it won't go to a server somewhere, it will go to the other, other device. And once you've connected this, you can disconnect from the back end entirely. So your two browser windows are running kind of off on their own. Uh, so once we've done that, what we can do is like, so basically this, this pipe is, it feels like a web socket. It's very kind of like loose. It's very um, kind of, you chuck something down one end, it comes out the other, um, and which is good. But it, it kind of like lacks a bit of structure. So what we can do is we can add message semantics. So we can basically type the messages going back and forth and add stuff, metadata like kind of uh, request IDs and so we can match up requests and responses and all that kind of stuff. And then on top of that, we can basically take a, a service proto file, and instead of taking the stubs from that and stick them in gRPC, we can just stick them in our kind of like hat together uh, kind of peer to peer connection. And then we can connect our code to it, and we've just got this really awkward but colorful diagram. Um, <laughs> and yeah, this is what we want. Um, so what this feels like is, so basically you implement a service, so this is like peer, this is implementing the Zoom server service, and it feels like you're implementing a backend server, but you've also got access to document body style, right? Like, so you can kind of, it feels like a backend thing, but you're implementing it in a, in a front end, which is kind of cool. Um, so we got, I've got a bit of a demo of this, which is the Zoom service web edition. Right, so we have that. 
Uh, and what I can do is I can take out the back end entirely because we don't need that anymore. Uh, and then here, we've got the Zoom service. So I'll put links up for this. Basically, what you can do is you can start the, the Zoom service, and then down the bottom, you get a link to join it. Uh, so that opens a new window. And so what's interesting here is we have got exactly the same front end component, but instead of talking to the back end, it's going to talk to the, the front end. So this echo service, hello world. So uh, yeah, the, the, the browser sounds different, I guess. So although this is like calculating here, it's actually running in this window. Uh, so we can see that if we open the dev tools, I don't want that. If I open that, and as I uh, type something here, you can see that it's actually, the code is executing in a different window uh, than where you're using it, um, which kind of works quite well. Uh, the system info stuff, you can't access CPU usage in a browser, which is kind of good. Uh, so basically, this is just some kind of like random uh, swaying thing. But what's cool about this is that because this is coming from a single, uh, because this is coming from a single other window, these two are now in sync, right? So you can basically use that that server in the browser to kind of synchronize state across two other two other windows. Um, so yeah, you can see that they're kind of like waving a bit in time, but the battery's random. Um, again. Screenshots are a bit of a, a thing. So in the screenshot one, instead of capturing a screenshot, what we're gonna do here is it's gonna load up a, a video context here in that other browser and take a really awkward picture of me here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ah, size down. So basically, yeah, what we're happening here, I'm taking pictures in that window but it's being served from that other browser context. Um, and what you can do with this is, um, you can access that. So we can actually do this between browsers as well, right? So Safari, if that opens. Right, so if I do a screenshot here, which might not work. Ah, oh, Safari's broken. <laughs> uh, I, I think I broke, basically two out of my three browsers are broken. Um, yeah, forget that. But yeah, anyway, so yeah, we're able to kind of um, do that stuff. Um, and then on the last one, so the, the color scheme services we had before, this doesn't really have a parallel in the, in the web. But what we can do is we can just change the CSS properties of that, that window like I showed you before. So we're basically trading that, that CSS change. And we can, the nice thing about this is the person implementing the server is able to implement it however they want, uh, which is kind of cool. All right. Um, Right, the other thing that we've got here, so we, the nice thing is we, we can have multiple services. So this is a, a debug service that I, I wrote. So you can see so this one, uh, what you've got here is you've got this. So my mouse position is being shared between the windows. So you can see this is like my ID uh, and you can see the kind of like the latency and obviously these are working on the same uh, host, but it would be close to this if we're on the same Wi-Fi network because um, yeah, uh, WebRTC is peer-to-peer. -peer. We can change the color here and that changes the color instantly in that other window. And these are all going all across this kind of uh, yeah, WebRTC tunnel stuff. Um, the, the other thing is, so basically uh, you can have multiple clients connecting to the same host. So here, because um, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a server, right? So here, you can see this one here is down there, and then we can still go up there and move that other one. Um, so this can, can be multiple people together. Um, and then the last demo. Um, so how do we do this? Uh, right, okay, so the last one is this drawing demo which I actually would like some help testing. Actually, screw it. R, P, C, 
uh, what was it? PRPC.net fine. So these are all hosted online, uh, and I'll share the link in a sec. You are did it. Um, so what I'm going to do is, if you open Meetup, I'm going to paste a comment in here. Uh, I'm in the server. You are in the server. So what you should come across here is, hopefully this will work. Um, so you should have this this uh, this window. You should see this if you follow that link. Hopefully, if I put the right one in. Yeah, join. Is that is that working at all? Yeah. This is embarrassing. It doesn't seem to like the touch. Uh, yeah. Oh well. Basically. Right, I'll try. If you try refreshing, so what's supposed to be going on? okay. So basically, <laughs> what you get is um, you can draw on this, and you can choose a color, um, and you can basically multiple people should be able to draw. I, don't, I wouldn't know why that's not working. Ah, odd. Well, uh, this sucks. <laughs> Just for the record. But basically, yeah, um, I'll give this a shot and I'll maybe share it in the meetup but yourself. Um, but yeah, you can kind of... I'll post in the meetup when I've fixed it. Um, <laughs> but it, the Wi-Fi blocking the RTC thing? It could be. So, cause, right, so WebRTC uses, um, is it stun and turn servers as a way of like uh, hole punching through net, NAT services. And so basically it's this weird tech where basically when you're behind, they'll, ha they'll open up a connection to your browser and then they'll transfer that connection to another client so that you can get around the problem of routers and stuff. But I think that might not be working. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's, prob that, that, that's probably it actually. Yeah, anyway, uh, give it a shot, it's fun. Um, so yeah, that, basically that link that I shared, um, you can basically go to any of these demos and you can run it yourself and uh, check it out and, and see other problems with it. Cool, right, okay, so the good, so that's kind of, that's that. Um, the thing I like about this particular one is like, if it had worked, you would have seen this, but um, it kind of prevent, it allows a different kind of interaction mode with the web, right? So usually everything is like server-based, whereas this is kind of, if you've got a web, server, web page running in the, the other side of the room, and everyone else is kind of connected to that, then you can do some kind of interesting things like multiplayer games or all that kind of stuff. And I think there's some kind of cool things to do with that. Um, I think, so in, another thing that I like about this is that I've written quite a few WebSocket-based APIs in the past, and they always are like duct taped together, um, whereas this feels quite kind of formal and strict and good, um, and it's quite, I've only been playing with it for a few days now, but it's like, it feels fun. Um, and the other thing that's cool is like, so the last thing that's cool is, there's something nice about building interfaces. So basically if I've got, if I build a, a game and I have a controller and I've got a web page that does that, you can use that in your game or maybe someone else can, and you can use my same code and someone else can create, create a game that has maybe three controllers or there's a kind of flexibility here um, that I've not really seen with other WebSocket-y stuff. Um, I think it could be cool. So yeah, um, in summary, protocol buffers, they're pretty cool. Uh, a bit of a faff sometimes. Um, gRPC is like mega cool if it fits your kind of your problems. Uh, and yeah, I, I'd give it a shot. PRPC uh, kind of breaks quite a lot. 100% <laughs> um, of the time, in fact. Um, but yeah, so but I'm really interested in this. So if anyone... Like, it's just some kind of weird hacks at the moment, but if anyone's interested in, like, making that into something else or, or chatting about some other opportunities with it, then, uh, yeah, like, let's chat. Um, and, yeah, so that's everything I've got. So thanks, and, yeah, Sarah and Marcus, nice one. Uh, cheers. <laughs>